Hello and welcome back to the Science Corner. Today's video will be about glycolysis. And I'm going to split up this pathway into two parts. The first part is going to invo be involving the reactions in the investment phase. And the second video will be the reactions involved in the payoff phase of this metapog pathway. Glycolysis is the conversion of glucose eventually into pyruvate and involves the lysis or breakdown of glucose, hence the name glycolysis, glycolysis. It's arguably one of the most important metabolic pathways since most organisms use this in order to make um, metabolic energy in the form of ATP and in our cells, eukaryotic cells. This, this series of reactions takes place in the cytoplasm. So let's get started. After consuming nutrients in the form of sugar, our pancreas releases a signal to release insulin. And here insulin is represented by this little red ball. Insulin will then bind to its tyrosine kinase receptors found on the cellular plasma membrane, which will then initiate a signaling cascade leading to the activation or fusion of these GLUT4 containing transporters to the plasma membrane. So once these, glute, once these vesicles fuse to the plasma membrane, the GLUT4 transporters are then embedded in the plasma membrane or, and are exposed to the extracellular um, environment. This allows for the rapid diffusion, facilitated diffusion of glucose down its concentration gradient into the cell. Okay, so now we have glucose in the cell in the cytoplasm more specifically, let's go through these reactions. <clears throat> the first reaction involves the phosphorylation of glucose. And this serves multiple purposes. First, it, by phosphorylating it, you add a strong negative charge to the molecule. And by doing that, you prevent the molecule from diffusing back across the plasma membrane which without these, this strong negative phosphate group, it would be able to rapidly diffuse back outside the cell. It also keeps the relative glucose concentration that's inside the cell low, which is what's allowing for the rapid diffusion down its concentration gradient. And also, like I said, this is these reactions are all involved in the investment phase, and so we are increasing the internal energy of the molecule. We are increasing the internal energy of the molecule so that later on we can utilize and harvest the energy to make some, some metabolic energy in the form of ATP. But more importantly, in terms of glycolysis, we are trying to gather electron transporters which would be used in other metabolic pathways downstream such as the electron transport chain for where you really gain a lot of ATP. So let's get, let's back up a step. So glucose here is converted into glucose 6-phosphate by either the enzyme hexokinase or glucokinase. And I'm not big on mechanisms, but since this is such a common event that happens, the phosphorylation event, not only in metabolic pathways, but various other pathways as well, such as signaling pathways, and it's pretty straightforward, I'm going to go through with the mechanism. And what's going to happen is the lone pair of electrons on this hydroxyl group off of carbon-6 is going to attack this relatively nucleophilic phosphate group 
the reason it's relatively nucleophilic is because it's surrounded by all these oxygen molecules which is, suck, which is sucking electron density away from it. So we take that lone pair, that lone pair attacks this phosphate group, and it's going to kick the electrons from this bond onto its neighboring oxygen. There we go. Wasn't that pretty straightforward? So now we have glucose 6-phosphate. And again, we've utilized one molecule of ATP for this to happen. You may be asking yourself, well, if we're trying to make energy here, why are we going to use energy? Like I've been saying over and over again, this is the investment phase. And in order to get more energy back in the end, we need to put in a little bit. And since we are using ATP here, Since we're adding a phosphate group onto glucose, we're increasing the internal energy of the molecule. So this obviously is not a spontaneous reaction. So that's why we have to utilize the hydrolysis of ATP. As we can see up here, the free energy change to form glucose 6-phosphate is actually positive. Remember, positive free energy change is a non-spontaneous reaction, while negative is. And the ATP hydrolysis the free energy change for the hydrolysis of ATP is about negative 30.5 kilojoules per mole. So if you couple these reactions together, you end up with an overall negative delta G naught prime. Remember, that's the free energy change um, under standard conditions. Is overall negative or spontaneous. And that translates over to a physiological delta G or del physiological free energy change of about negative 33.9 kilojoules per mole. That is significantly negative. And because that is significantly negative and so much energy is, um, the free energy change in the molecule, so much energy is given off, this reaction is highly regulated. Before we get into the regulation of glucose or hexokinase, I'm just going to go over the various forms of this molecule, of this enzyme. So there's two types of hexokinases. You have type 1, which is found primarily in the brain, and we have type 2, which is found in the muscle. If you remember from your basic biology classes, Brain cells use primarily or exclusively use glucose, sugars, to make energy. And because the brain is such a vital organ and because it only uses sugars to make cellular energy, the type 1 hexokinase is relatively efficient, has a relatively high binding affinity for glucose and ATP. And the way we describe um, the affinity of, for an enzyme for, of an enzyme for its substrate, if you remember from your enzyme, enzyme kinetics, is by its Km, also known as the michaelis menten constant. So the Km for type 1 hexokinase is 0 0.03 millimolar. That is the That is the cellular concentration of glucose needed in order for this reaction, for this enzyme to undergo this reaction. Type 2, which is found in muscle, is still pretty low. It's 0 0.3 millimolar. Not as strong of affinity than type 1 has. But it's still good enough because your normal blood glucose concentration levels exist at about 4 millimolar. So pretty much type 1 and type 2 hexokinases are constantly active because our, norm, our blood glucose levels are typically always above the Km of those two enzymes. Now something that's a bit different is glucokinase, and glucokinase is found exclusively in the liver. Its Km is 10 millimolar. So this enzyme isn't nearly as active as the hexokinase enzymes are. 
and only is active when glucose levels are extremely high in the body. And in fact, the glucose 6-phosphate formed by glucokinase doesn't continue down glycolysis. It actually goes to form glycogen. It's stored energy. So back to regulation, glucose hexokinase is strongly inhibited by its product, a negative feedback mechanism, Gluco by glucose 6-phosphate. Makes sense. If we have excess glucose 6-phosphate, why are we going to make even more? Let's utilize what we have first before we make more. Great, so now we have glucose 6-phosphate. The next reaction, reaction 2, involves the isomerization of glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate, or the conversion of an aldose to a ketose. This is catalyzed by phosphoglucoisomerase. And there are a couple of functions here. We are making the molecule more symmetric, because as you'll see in a couple reactions down the road, we are actually going to cleave the carbon-carbon bond between carbons 3 and carbon 4. And also, for the next reaction, we are going to phosphorylate carbon 1 here. And the secondary alcohol is much more difficult to attack than the primary alcohol on fructose 6-phosphate. Its delta G value is relatively um, unchanged. It's close to zero, negative 2.92 kilojoules per mole, which means that this reaction can actually proceed in both directions relatively easily. The next reaction, reaction 3, is probably the most important reaction in the glycolytic pathway because it commits the molecule of glucose to go through all the way to pyruvate. And this is, of course, phosphofructokinase, or commonly abbreviated to PFK. That's the phosphorylation of fructose 6-phosphate into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. As you can see, we have our phosphate on carbon 6 and our phosphate on carbon 1. Here we create an even higher energy molecule. Similarly to the first reaction, the free energy change between fructose 6-phosphate and fructose 1,6-bisphosphate alone is highly positive. So we have to couple the hydrolysis of ATP to this to make it a favorable reaction. And as you can see, in, under physiological conditions, the free energy change is negative 18.8 kilojoules per mole. Therefore, it's highly favorable. And now the molecule is symmetric for cleavage in the next reaction. The, re the regulation of this enzyme is much more stringent than that of hexokinase. There are a couple inhibitors. We have ATP as an inhibitor, as well as citrate. Now you might be asking yourself, well, how can we utilize ATP here, but also have it inhibit the enzyme? Well, the answer to that is there are two separate binding pockets for ATP on this enzyme. There's a higher affinity binding pocket and a lower affinity binding pocket. The inhibitor pocket has a relatively low affinity compared to its counterpart. So un only under extremely high concentrations of ATP will ATP bind to the inhibiting pocket. Most time, it will bind preferentially to the um, active site. And if we look, we can see that easily by looking at a graph of reaction velocity versus increasing concentrations of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate under two conditions. Under conditions of low concentrations of ATP, 
we see a typical hyperbolic curve that we see normally in our when we study enzyme kinetics. You know, this number up here correlates to our maximum velocity. And half of that velocity is our Km. And again, this is under conditions of low ATP, low concentrations of ATP. If we perform the same reaction, but just increase, significantly increase the levels of ATP, we see something that's very different. We see not a hyperbolic curve, but a sigmoidal curve. Something along the lines of this. Again, the Vmax remains the same, but our Km, something like that, is significantly higher. And remember, this is under high concentrations of ATP. The higher the Km, the lower the binding affinity. Again, the higher the Km here, the lower the affinity, and vice versa. They have an inversely proportional relationship. The lower the Km, the higher the affinity. So the other inhibitor is citrate, which is a downstream metabolic pathway of glycolysis in the citric acid cycle. And when that cycle becomes saturated, you have increased concentrations of citrate. It will bind to the low affinity binding pocket as an allosteric inhibitor of fructose, phosphofructokinase. There are also a couple activators of this pathway along with the inhibitors, that is AMP and fructose 2, 6 bisphosphate. They promote the activity of phosphofructokinase. Okay, so let's recap real fast. We went from glucose, we phosphorylated the carbon 6 to make glucose 6 phosphate. We isomerized the aldose sugar into a ketose sugar to help make the cement molecule more symmetric and to allow for the hydroxyl group off of carbon 1 to be attacked more easily. And now we phosphorylate that carbon. The fourth reaction involves the cleavage, as I've been alluding to, between carbons 3 and carbons 4. Now that we have our symmetric molecule, we can make two similar molecules, that is the conversion of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to glucose to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphate, G3P and DHAP, by the enzyme aldolase. The reason it's called aldolase is because it's a reverse aldocondensation. And again, similarly to reaction three, or sorry, reaction two, the free energy change is relatively neutral. It's close to zero, that is of negative, two point, negative 0.23 kilojoules per mole. So it can proceed in either direction fairly easily. But we have a problem here. Only one of these molecules can proceed through the rest of the glycolytic pathway, and that is glucose glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So in order to be able to utilize both of these molecules to gain more energy in the second half of the reactions, we need to find a way to convert dihydroxyacetone phosphate into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And that is, of course, exactly what our cells have been able to devise. And that's going to occur in the last reaction, or reaction 5, of the investment phase, and that is the conversion of dihydroxyacetone phosphate into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate by the enzyme triose phosphate isomerase. Its free energy change is relatively neutral, close to zero as well, positive 2.41 kilojoules per mole under physiological conditions. And now we have two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, which will now be able to slowly 
through a series of reactions, extract some energy out of this molecule. Since we have these high energy phosphate groups, and be able to convert it into pyruvate, which will be used in other metabolic pathways downstream, more specifically the citric acid cycle, and the electron transport chain. All right, I hope you enjoyed this video. And um, check out video two to check out the rest of the glycolytic pathway and the payoff phase.